I'll relax and meet and chat. And I'll introduce you to Roxanne Nightingale, who wants to speak. Thank you. It's my great pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Natasha Raja, uh, who's coming from uh, McGill University and the Douglas Center in Montreal. And I just realized that this year is actually 20 years ago that I met um, Natasha for the first time. So Natasha was finishing her PhD with Randy McIntosh at the Rotman Education Institute in Toronto. And I had just joined uh, Randy's group for a postdoc. Um, and we were, so there was like a floor with all of these postdocs. And we were all completely amazed by this young lady who was finishing her PhD, who knew absolutely everything. And this was confirmed by Myra, who was also happened to interact with <laughs> Natasha. And um, Natasha has actually, uh, had actually published already a paper in science in 1999. And by the time she uh, defended her PhD in 2003 in experimental psychology from the University of Toronto, she had already co-authored nine papers uh, with the Rotman group in top tier journals. So neuromage, junior neuroscience, uh, cerebral cortex, science, I mean, it was quite amazing. Um, so Natasha went to do a postdoc uh, with at UC Berkeley with um, uh, Margaret Cecilio and continued. So she's working on memory. The Rotman Research Institute is really specialized on memory. You've done working, uh, working memory, episodic memory, essentially sensory memory. Continued with the frontal lobe function um, with uh, Randy Buckner. Um, and then came back to Canada and got an assistant professor um, position at the Douglas Center in Montreal, which is affiliated with McGill. Um, and so you are uh, now a full professor. So she stayed over there and uh, is now a full professor uh, in the Department of Psychiatry, which is affiliated so at McGill, which is affiliated with the center, and also an affiliate of the Department of Psychology at uh, McGill University. She continues to publish. Uh, in top tier journal, um, she has, well, I need my notes for this one. Uh, she has received a number of awards, um, but I think the one that I want to uh, emphasize the most, if I can turn my paper, um, is uh, um, the uh, recent, so salary, salary award, because it's really hard to get the PI Shar uh, salary award. Fonds de recherche pour le Québec en français. Um, and uh, so the ticket um, FRQS, Junior Salary 1, Junior Salary 2, and I, I insist on that because these are extremely difficult uh, grants to get. Um, but currently holds the CHR Chair in Sex and Gender Research in Neuroscience, Mental Health and Addiction. And I think this is where it's really interesting. So she continues to work on memory, but uh, she has uh, introduced and included uh, EDI perspective in both her research and then her mentorship. So in 2019, she received a mentorship award, uh, Women in Cognitive Science Canada. So I had hopefully memorized or remember that she was at the meeting that she was. Um, and so she's been, uh, she's been a great mentor and really trying to push uh, our women in neuroscience and cognitive neuroscience because there's uh, definitely a lack. Um, and uh, uh, so she sits on a number of board of director um, and advisor for the Women in Cognitive Science Society of Canada, um, and is also right now uh, serves as the chair of equity, diversity, and inclusion at the Douglas Research Center. But I think what really is interesting is seeing this progression not only to uh, uh, support women in uh, cognitive neuroscience, but also start uh, pushing uh, for uh, uh, Learning more and, and embedded in the I, uh, EDI, sorry, in the actual research. I think that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, so uh, please join me in welcoming Natasha Rakhi. I don't, I don't know how to turn this thing off. So. <laughs> okay. Okay, there we go. Go. Thought I clicked it. I'm gonna do this. Yeah. Yeah. It's doing something weird on my computer. Oh, I think it's a separate screen. Can you? That's the thing. I'm trying to scroll up, and it won't let me. Can you go to the left or right? No, I can't escape my. 
Okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you. All right. First, thank you. Thank you to the organizing committee. And I'm really excited to be here this year as part of a University of Waterloo's Brain Day. And really excited to talk to you about uh, the importance of considering biological sex and diversity in the cognitive neuroscience of aging and memory. Before I begin, I just want to acknowledge my team, my funders, and my collaborators, without whom the work I'm going to talk to you about today wouldn't have been possible. So I'm going to give you a bit of an overview of what I'm going to talk to you about over the next hour. So first, I'm going to set up the background, right? So I'm going to give you a bit of a background of what we know about cognitive aging, what we kind of know about the cognitive neuroscience of aging, episodic memory particularly, and then present to you some results from a study conducted in my lab called the adult, the Montreal Adult Lifespan Study in Episodic Memory. And I'm going to say, well, this is where we usually stop the talk. And then I'm then going to challenge the assumptions made in my own study and the assumptions made in our, in our field in general in the cognitive neuroscience of memory and aging. I'm going to focus on the cognitive neuroscience of memory and aging, but I would say that this kind, the assumptions made in our field kind of follows from most of psychology and cognitive neuroscience as well. And so some of the assumptions is that females and males age similarly, and that the neural correlates of age-related decline in memory are the same in males and females. I'm going to challenge that assumption. And then another assumption is that individual differences in our life experiences that can be encapsulated by racial experiences, ethnic differences, cultural differences, means that we all age the same, and that our models of normative aging applies to everybody. I'm going to challenge that assumption. And then I'm going to kind of conclude by giving some solutions, because you know, we could challenge these assumptions, but if there's no solutions, what are, we, what are we supposed to do? And some approaches we're taking in my lab to kind of conduct a more inclusive type of cognitive neuroscience and memory and aging, so that our models are more representative and can generalize uh, to other cohorts. And then I'm going to conclude by saying that, you know, this is a Coles Notes version of the talk, that we really do need more inclusive models in the cognitive neuroscience of memory and aging so that we can better predict who will age well and who will need more care as they age, and then also develop more culturally sensitive tools for intervention at that time. Okay, so to begin, you know, those of us that are in cognitive neuroscience of aging know this slide very, very well. So this is a figure from a seminal review paper done by Denise Park and Patty Ruta Lawrence back in 2009 but they basically summarize the field of cognitive aging and they highlight what types of cognitive domains are impacted by aging and what domains remain relatively intact as we age. So you'll note from this slide that, I'm just gonna put on my pointer, um, there are many cognitive, de cognitive domains that decline with age. So you have declines in speed of processing, you have declines in working memory, so our ability to maintain and manipulate information online, which is also considered a type of cognitive control process, and declines in long-term memory. One type of long-term memory is episodic memory, and I'll talk to you a bit about that type of memory system in a while. But it's not all bad news, right? There are some abilities that maintain their function with age, so our world knowledge or our semantic memory. Now, in my lab over the last two decades, we've been really interested in understanding the neural correlates of age-related episodic memory decline. And the reason we've been focusing on episodic memory decline in my lab is, is because it's one of the complaints that older adults come to the clinic with. It really affects their quality of life. And it's also one of the earliest and most consistent signs of Alzheimer's disease, which is a fatal chronic neurodegenerative disorder that accounts for the majority of dementias in the world. So with this in mind, my lab has been kind of trying to understand what happens with normative aging. So how does the brain and the neural cords of episodic memory decline uh, occur in normative models of aging so that we could inform our understanding of pathological aging from those models. So before we could do that kind of work, however, we have to have clear operational definitions of our concepts. And so what is episodic memory? Like I'm going to hearken to the more classical definition of episodic memory presented by Endel Tulving back in 1972 as our ability to encode and consciously recollect past experiences in rich contextual detail. So this type of memory emphasizes our personal experience. By all my hand motion. 
right? And it emphasized the fact that recollection and our memory is a constructive process that includes not only the items that were the focus of our attention, so the objects, the people, and the events that we encountered in our past, but also the surrounding context. Now, there's been many types of different tasks that have been developed over the years to help us understand what types of cognitive processes are important for maintaining episodic memory. But the general conclusion in the field is really there's many types of processes and not just mnemonic processes. So I want to do a little experiment with you. So tomorrow, when someone asks you, where were you in the audience when you saw Natasha speak, you could answer that question in two different ways. You could have a real recollection of where you are in a spatial map of this room and say, oh, I was sitting in the back left corner. Or you could remember your field of view and where I was and then infer the information. So you could do this type of memory task, which is called a source memory task or a context memory task, using both core spatial mnemonic processes, but also engaging more cognitive control, strategic, inferential, you know, pro like things that are involved in planning types of processes or cognitive control processes. So this just highlights that episodic memory engages a lot of different cognitive processes. So it's not surprising that in the field of neuropsychology and neuroimaging, that we've known that episodic memory actually relies on the structural integrity and functional integration of numerous brain regions and networks. And we've known this for a while, right? It's just now it's becoming more and more popular to think in this way. So this is a study conducted by Lars Nyberg and colleagues like 23 years ago, in 2000, where they had individuals encode sentences and pictures while they were undergoing PET scans. So PET scanning is a bit of a different methodology compared to event-related fMRI. In PET, you inject someone with a radioisotope, and you only have a one-minute window. So you get a one-minute snapshot of what they're doing. And so what they did in this experiment is they had young adults encode sentences and pictures, and then they had them retrieve sentences and pictures. And the manipulation they used was at retrieval. And in the low-target situation, they had zero old stimuli. So there was nothing that you actually encoded in that one minute window, but they were in this retrieval mode. In the medium targets situation, they had 50% old and 50% new. And in the high target situation, it was 100% old. And then they took these PET images and they applied a multivariate technique called partial least squares to identify brain networks that differentiated the states, the cognitive states in which individuals were in. And so on the left-hand side, you see the partial least squares analysis of the PET images. And you can see there's blue regions and yellow regions. This is 23 years ago, so you know the graphical representations weren't all that great back then. And what I want you to note is like the increased activity in the blue regions, which included the medial temporal lobes, areas that we know are important from memory, were more engaged during encoding relative to retrieval, whereas the yellow regions, which included lateral frontal areas, and parietal regions were more engaged in retrieval. But I want you to note that at retrieval, they really didn't vary based on how many old stimuli they were. It was kind of just a constant state. And so this really is a pattern reflecting just being in what they called retrieval mode or a retrieval state. So this is setting up your model, setting up what the brain is about to do, regardless of how well you're doing it. Now, more recently, using event-related fMRI, Rugg and Wilberg did a meta-analysis where they looked at all the papers using event-related fMRI that looked at encoding and retrieval. The difference between event-related fMRI and PET is you get a whole brain pattern of activation every two seconds, so boom, 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 right? And so with that technology, because of that temporal resolution, you could dissociate what is active during correct retrieval and what is inactive during correct retrieval. And using that type of methodology, Rugg and Wilberg identified a very different pattern of brain activation compared to what we see here. They identified these midline cortical regions that included the medial PFC, the campus, parapocampal gyrus, retrospinal cortex, or cingulate, angular gyrus, that was more active during successful retrieval. So this is when you're actually recollecting a past event. So what's going on here? Why are these two results so different? Well, it kind of goes in, in line with the idea that to do episodic memory tasks, you actually need to engage multiple networks. Some, such as the frontal parietal or cognitive control networks that set up the state in which you're going to do the task, and others, such as these midline cortical networks 
which Ruggenberg called uh, the recollection network, but many of you might recognize as the default mode network as being engaged in the successful retrieval. So what is the default mode network, right? This is a network you've all heard of, and the way it was defined was, originally was called the resting state network. It was defined by people just lying in the scanner and doing nothing. But do we actually ever do nothing, right? So instead of calling it resting state network or default mode network, it really is a free state network, a network that is engaged when you're basically allowed to think whatever you want. And often we think about our past. And so it's not surprising that successful retrieval and recollection would align with this activation of the default mode now. So that's kind of just the background of what we know about episodic memory function in healthy young adults. So I do aging research, and I try and understand what changes with normative aging that correlates with uh, age-related declines in episodic memory. So folks like me ask the question, how does age-related decline in episodic memory relate to altered structural integrity, activity, and functional connectivity amongst these types of networks, the medial temporal lobe system, default mode network, and cognitive control networks. To ask this question, we first have to have some understanding of how do older adults perform episodic memory tasks. So the assumption is that there's age-related episodic memory decline. But is that true? Is there a decline across all domains, across all types of tasks? In fact, there's a lot of literature showing that older adults have difficulties, and I think Myra contributed to this literature, have difficulties when there's not enough environmental support, there's a lack of depth of processing, and when memory tasks require individuals to use self-initiated strategies or goals to organize information at encoding and retrieval. So based on this, you would, you would not be surprised that some episodic memory tasks older adults perform pretty well on when there's a lot of environmental support and you don't need a lot of strategy used to ex execute them, but others they really do start to show market decline at a very young age, actually, at midlife. And so these tasks are called source or context memory tasks. So here's some data from a study we did back in 2010, where we had young and older adults come into the lab and perform three different types of tasks. So the first task, they saw faces, photographs, black and white photographs of age variant faces that were presented to the left or the right of a computer screen. And they were told either memorize these faces, that was one instruction. The other one was memorize these faces and their spatial location. And then the final instruction was memorize these faces and the temporal order in which they were presented. And then after a break, they did a retrieval task for these types of experiments. And so they did a recognition retrieval task where they saw two faces. One was old, one was new. Which face do you remember seeing? The other type, two faces, both are old. Which of these were either on the left or the right of the screen? And the other type, temporal context, two faces, both old. Which of these two faces were seen most recently or least recently? So when it comes to the recognition memory task, the item recognition task, you'll notice that young and older adults perform relatively the same, comparatively. Now, there are limits to this. If you really push the task difficulty and you put a lot of items to be encoded, then you will start to see decrements with age there as well. But on average, item recognition and item memory remains relatively intact in older age in normative aging. The story is a bit different for pathological aging. You actually start to see item memory deficits in Alzheimer's disease as well. In contrast, however, spatial and temporal context memory, you see marked deficits in older adults compared to young adults. So the next study that my lab did was a study called the Montreal Adult Lifespan Study. And our goal here was really to understand when do these types of context memory deficits arise. And so this was led by my former PhD student, Lizzie Ankudovich, and it's exactly the same experiment, but we dropped the item recognition paradigm because we weren't that interested in that. We know they're gonna do fine. And we used the same types of encoding and retrieval, but we also introduced a difficulty manipulation where they, we increased the number of stimuli they had to encode um, from six to 12. And so we had two levels of difficulty, spatial easy, spatial hard, temporal easy, temporal hard. And the reason we did that was there was a big debate in the field of cognitive aging about whether or not the age effects we see in our paradigms are indeed age effects or performance effects. So put in another, in another way, I could take you a young adult and make you look old if it was a performance effect by just making the task harder and harder. 
So what are the patterns of brain activation we see in older adults that reflect performance? And so if we made the task easier, actually, there's no age problem in those systems. But, and then what are the systems that might actually just show age effects, regardless of performance effects? So that's why we introduced that difficulty manipulation into this paradigm. So here you see the behavioral results of the study. And you see that, on average, there's a decline in spatial and temporal context memory with advanced age. Now, what we noticed with the performance effect, and why, we, why I collapsed it for this figure, is that it was parallel. So older adults just found the difficult tasks more difficult, and, but they performed parallel to the young. So there was this a hit of difficulty, but otherwise there was no other age-related interaction in that effect. And so we also collected event-related fMRI on this study. And what we used to analyze our event-related fMRI was, again, this multivariate partial least squares analysis technique. Not going to detail, but you guys are all into math, so you can ask your questions about it after. Um, in multivariate behavioral partial least squares, it's a data-driven method. So what we do is we enter the fMRI data. We don't model it. We don't manipulate it. We don't like, match it to an HRF function or anything like that. What we do is we take the events where they successfully encoded or retrieved, and then we string them along with their onset, and then eight seconds after, or sorry, 16 seconds, eight legs after, 16 seconds after, and we stack them along. We just create this fMRI data matrix of subjects. And in this analysis, we had subjects as a continuous variable, and then we looked at how activation differed based on individual differences in age and individual differences in accuracy on the spatial and temporal context memory tasks. And we orthogonalized these two vectors. Now, why did we do that? Because of this debate about what is an age effect and what is a performance effect, right? So if we orthogonalize these vectors, well, we're pushing them to be independent, right? But if they aren't independent, if they are related, then that kind of tells us that these effects might, in fact, reflect this age performance trade-off that we're looking for. And so using this technique, we identified several latent variables. Um, which are the effects that PLS yields. A latent variable consists of three components, a singular value, which reflects the amount of cross-covariance accounted for in the first uh, in the matrix that's in that, in, um, submitted to SVD, a singular image, which reflects the degree of activation or deactivation that is symmetrically paired with a correlation profile. So in this case, we'll have correlation profiles for age by activity and for performance by activity. And the important thing to note is these, these relationships are symmetrically paired. And so we identified many significant latent variables in this analysis. And the first was exactly what we were looking for, this age performance trade-off. And I hope you recognize this network again, because again, it's the default mode network. So we identified a pattern in the default mode network where we saw a splitting of it, where we saw regions of the default mode network that increased with age, which is in black, a decrease with performance. So as you get older, you perform poorer. And then we also identified areas in blue that showed their inverse relationship. So increased activity with better performance, but older adults were not activating these regions. So this indicated to us that this pattern really did highlight that activation in the default mode network and differences in uh, activation in the default mode network that are often reported in the aging literature may not be reflecting age effects per se, but performance effects and that age performance trade-off. Now, in contrast, we also identified another latent variable that basically encapsulated these frontal parietal cognitive control networks. In contrast to the previous latent variable, this one really was an age effect. So increased activation in these areas, these blue areas, with age at encoding was observed, but it didn't reflect any relationship to behavior. So increasing activation with age was not compensatory in our older adults. In contrast, engaging these same systems at retrieval was performance related, but not so much age related. So we could conclude from this finding that really the activation patterns in frontal parietal cortex that we see with age may in fact reflect something related to age and not so much a performance effect. And so from the study, we came to these general conclusions. These were the first papers that were published in the lifespan study. And basically, we said, you know, there's an age performance trade-off that seems to be in the default mode network, different areas doing different things related to age versus performance in that network, whereas 
there's an age effect in these more frontal parietal areas. And it doesn't seem to be compensatory. So older adults are engaging this. Perhaps they're setting a different state in which they're approaching the task. But it's not helping their performance the way that they're doing. That would have been it. This is cognitive neuroscience, me memory and aging 101, right? Now, historically, this is what people have done. They've just kind of left it there. But there are many assumptions in this type of analysis that I myself have been guilty of, right? So one of the assumptions is that the neural correlates of age-related memory decline are the same in females and males. Now, why would we do this? Like, why would we think this? Like, there's literature out there in episodic memory that's showing that there are types of episodic memory tasks that males perform better than females and vice versa. So why don't we and other people in the cognitive neuroscience of aging and memory explore this further? Well, one of the primary reasons is that, yes, there might be tasks where there's sex differences, but those sex differences are often maintained across the adult lifespan. So in this task, there was no sex difference in performance. And there was no sex by age interaction either. So if you're, just, if you're doing just a behavioral analysis, you would just stop there. But it's important to note that even in the presence of comparable performance in males and females, it is possible that the underlying neural mechanisms of age-related memory decline differ. And so it's important for us to look at females and males separately, or at least examine, in contrast, males and females' memory-related uh, brain activation as they age to understand if the neural basis of cognitive decline are the same in males and females. It also is possible that the compensatory mechanisms that males and females engage to support memory as it starts to fail as we age may differ. But we don't know because we don't look at this right now in the field. Now, why is it important to look at it in the field? Well, one of the reasons is that there's many disorders, both developmentally and neurologically, that have sex differences in their prevalence rates. One of them is Alzheimer's disease. So, Two-thirds of the cases of Alzheimer's disease in North America is in females. Now, is the incidence different between males and females? That's a hot debate. Some studies find that there is a difference in incidence rates, but overall, we do know there's a difference in prevalence rate. And the argument to date has been that, well, women live longer in Alzheimer's disease, a disease of aging, so that's why we have a higher prevalence rate of Alzheimer's disease in females. Now, this is only true in North America. There's some data in Europe that suggests that that also might happen in Europe, but it really is sporadic. And we don't know if there's sex differences globally in how Alzheimer's presents. But what this tells us is that if there's a difference in prevalence rate, and if it's not all due to women living longer, then maybe the way that we age is different. Males and females might age differently. Now, this is important considering that males show more Parkinson's than females. There's diseases that like, affect males and females differentially, meaning that perhaps the way that males and females and our brains age differ. Performance-wise, we might not differ at all. Like our data show performance, there's no difference. But the way we engage and do the task and how that changes with the age may differ. Now you'd think, you know, based on the fact that there's sex differences in prevalence rates, and we know that there's some sex differences in episodic memory tasks that Oh, there have been so many studies in the cognitive neuroscience of aging that have already tackled this. Well, no, um, <laughs> that's not what's happened. So in a review done by Dotson and Duarte in 2020, they looked at the top tier journals of cognitive neuroscience. They didn't want to publish the names, but I know it's in your image and journal of cognitive neuroscience that they looked at. And they looked at all the publications from 2019 onward, um, 2019 to 2020, to see what did they publish, and then how many of them actually reported sex or gender variables in their tables, and then how many of them actually analyze the data based on sex or gender. And what they found was, you know, most of us that do this work, we report our, you know, the number of females and males in our samples. Um, so 99% of the studies reported it, but only 8% actually looked at it. Now, in the neuroscience in general, there's been a lot of kind of policy implementation into increasing the representation of sexes in studies. So the NIH had the Re Revitalization Act, which they required individuals to now include male and female animals and male and female participants in clinical trials and in human subject testing as well. The CIHR has now included that. If anyone's written a CIHR grant lately, you have to fill in that sex section about sex and gender. Are you considering sex or gender in your analysis? If not, why? So there's been a lot of push to increase the representation of both sexes in our research, both in the animal models and in human models. 
And we have seen some movement in the data that's being published. So whereas only 29% of studies represented both sexes in 2009, now 49% of the studies did. So there's been some movement there. But when you look at, do we actually analyze based on sex or gender, the number falls. So really there's a very low rate of studies that analyze based on sex and gender. So inclusion of, a, of sexes is not enough, right? You can't just include the males and females if you're not gonna look at males and females, either by disaggregating the data and doing within group analysis or doing some sort of between group approach. So that's one of the assumptions that we really need to challenge. Another, sorry, another assumption that we have to challenge is that the neural correlates of age-related memory decline are the same across different races, cultures, and other cohorts. Now, why do we need to challenge this? One of the reasons is that, again, the prevalence rates of diseases are different based on ethnicity and racial background. So the CHAP study in the USA found that there's 19% of Blacks and 14% of Hispanics 65 years and older are diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease, whereas only 10% of whites in the USA 65 years and older are diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. So why is this? Now in Canada, we really do need a lot of work in Canada. Canada has not even collected this type of data before. Right? We're just starting to look at race and ethnicity, and it's probably because it's you know, politically uh, contentious and we want to be polite and all of that, but we need to actually look at these kind of figures because as we know from the USA, there is a difference in prevalence rate suggesting that some individuals in our society are more at risk of developing these life-threatening diseases. In fact, here's the quote from the Canadian Dementia Strategy Annual Report from just last year. While the prevalence of dementia within Canada's ethnic and cultural communities is unknown, expanding data about their health-related issues could assist in understanding ways in which their vulnerabilities to dementia could be reduced. So in other words, we need to do better. We don't know in Canada. Now, in that same review article by Dotson and Duarte, they looked at this question as well. They looked at the 208 studies that they found in those top tier journals, and they looked at how many studies actually reported race or ethnicity, and then how many of them reported related variables such as socioeconomic status or SES. And what they found was only 14% of studies reported race or ethnicity, 18% reported SES. And of all those 208 studies, three were done in all white samples. Representation of other racially diverse groups varied from 0% up to 50% for Asians. And in the US, Asians is a global term for that entire continent. So they do not parse out East and South Asians or anything like that. Um, and then only three studies, even though 14 and 18% might have looked at these variables and put them in their demographics table, only three studies actually looked at race or ethnicity in the cognitive neurosciences. And I'm going to present to you one of them that looked at it in the cognitive neuroscience of aging as a kind of like a, a way this has been done in the past and then challenging maybe the way that it's been done in the past. So here's a study done by Zahondi et al., where they looked at cognitive function in white individuals, and then they compared black individuals and Hispanic individuals. Now, just look at this graph. It's differences in black and Hispanics relative to white. So who are we considering our norm when we do this kind of study, and when we present results like this? Right? We have to be mindful of the fact that most of the field of cognitive neuroscience of aging and dementia has been conducted on white, highly educated, these weird populations that were already discussed, and we're calling that normal. And now everyone is different from that. So we have to kind of think about the language we use and who our comparison group is, and if it's valid to compare one group against the other. So another thing to note is they plot these, you know, these, uh, and I'm not gonna, I don't wanna crap on this study because they're great scientists, but it's just, Historical, right? This is the thing you, learn, you do, you learn, and you're like, oh, we could do this better. And so then they looked at what were the MRI correlates of these behavioral deficits in Blacks and Hispanics. And what they found was, you know, white matter hyperintensity increases was correlated with poor cognitive performance in Blacks, whereas it was hippocampal volume decline 
that was correlated with poor cognitive performance in Hispanics. They failed to acknowledge that their demographics also varied by their age, I mean, by their groups. So you really need to think about when you're doing these kinds of studies and incorporating questions about race and ethnicity, how you approach that question. We know that race is a social construct, and many of the results that, we've looked, that have been reported in Blacks and Hispanics are really due to the histories and the disadvantages and disparities in the social determinants of health that these individuals have experienced, so, such as education, SES, access to health care, access to good food, and access to a safe environment so you can have those lifestyle factors that actually support cognitive aging as well. So we must contextualize our finding based on these histories. And these differences in histories can lead to different patterns of neurocognitive aging. So one thing to keep in mind is, yes, these differences are probably due to social determinants of health and lifestyle factors. But these things matter, and they do impact your biology. Having this model of biology and these models where you know, these neurons work together and they're kind of working in isolation with no contextualization of those models, that these neurons working, are not working in isolation. Your, social, your societal experiences, the food you had as a child, the education that you were exposed to will change your biology. It will, there is a social biology inter interaction that we need to kind of consider when we're building our models in general. And so the last question is, who do we use our, as our norm? I already touched on this. So when you're doing this type of research, and you want to look at differences and differences in patterns in cognitive aging and prevalence rates of dementia, you know, perhaps we shouldn't use the term groups and differences. Perhaps we should use individual differences instead and look at the individual. And this is extremely important to me because everyone talks about precision healthcare. We need to individualize our interventions. We need to do this. We need to do that. But when you look at the way that we analyze our data, we group everyone. We look at means, we look at standard errors. You're different than, that, than this mean. But instead, what we should be looking at is individual differences. And how do individual differences in your environment, lifestyle, and social context that influence your brain or your resilience? So one model that I'm kind of working with now is consideration of individual differences. So including as many people from as broad a different uh, background as possible, and then coding for lifestyle factors, social determinants of health, and then looking at how do those then influence this concept of resilience. So what is resilience? So resilience in the clinical neuroscience field is our brain's ability to withstand acute and chronic insults, right? So how much can your brain take, essentially? How many punches can you take to your brain and still be able to maintain your high level of cognitive function? Within that model, within that clinical model, aging is a chronic insult. Right? So as we age, there's this slow deterioration. And so what allows your brain to be more resilient to this chronic aging effect? So what we know is that higher levels of social determinants of health might set you up for greater level of resilience through maybe increasing concepts like brain reserve. So what is the structural connectivity? How connected is your brain to begin with structurally? And then also this concept of cognitive reserve. How has your education and life experiences provided you with alternate strategies that allow you to functionally manipulate and change the functional context in which your brain is, func is working in order to do a task. So when one system goes down, other systems are present to functionally compensate. And then the other concept that we talk about in this field that we talk about resilience in is maintenance. And that comes down again to a good lifestyle, ability to engage in good dietary practices, to really feed your body and your brain in order to maintain its structural integrity or its brain reserve throughout the lifespan. So this is another way of thinking about looking at individual differences. So you might, you might use this type of modeling to look at racial differences, ethnic differences, sex and gender differences. But instead of talking about group differences, we could actually talk about the individual and map them out if you do these types of social questionnaires and, and contextualize the individual. So there's evidence. So what I want to show is, you know, so far I've shown you that there is evidence that there are sex and or gender and racial differences in the prevalence rates of neurodegenerative diseases, which challenge the assumption 
and highlight that using high functioning, highly educated white individuals as our representative norm is probably not helping any of us, right? It's, it's preventing precision medicine from those that have also been studied in some ways. Um, and it highlights the need for really doing a more equitable approach to the cognitive neuroscience and memory and aging. So this is the problem. How do we solve for it? So what can we do? So one thing my lab has done is we've tried to correct the errors of our ways by reanalyzing data. And you know, if you think, oh, you can't publish when you reanalyze, you're wrong. You can publish when you reanalyze. When you frame your question to say, you know, we did this, we found this, we think we might have been wrong, so we're now going to look at it this way. And that's exactly what we did in my lab. So we first revisited that Montreal Adult Lifespan study. And we asked the question, well, were there sex differences in the way that you know, individuals age? And this was led by my former student, Savanya Supramaniapale. And so what she did was she took our Montreal Adult Lifespan study. And one thing, big secret in the cognitive neuroscience and memory and aging, most of our studies involves females. And so in fact, when you think of the cognitive neuroscience of aging, we, it's the cognitive neuroscience of aging for females. We actually don't know much about men male brain aging, because males don't participate in our study as much. So she was limited by the males that did participate in this study. And what she did was she age and education matched our females to the males that participated in the study. And then we also excluded females that reported being in perimenopause or early menopause transition and midlife, because there's evidence that menopause affects functional connectivity between the prefrontal and hippocampal systems, systems that are implicated in episodic memory. And so we didn't include those females. And we reran that same old PLS analysis, but now we had a between group factor of biological sex. So the exact same analysis was conducted with age and accuracy, but now we were comparing males and females. And this was our first latent variable that we identified. I hope you recognize it, because it was our first, or it was our, that frontal parietal network that we identified in the lifespan study. But here, we see that the age effect is driven by females. Right? So, and this is not because of sample size, because we match sample size, and we match education, right? And so, I just want to orient you. Here are the males and females. This is the age correlation up here. This is the performance correlation. So, with increased performance at encoding and at retrieval in females, you have more activation in these frontal parietal areas. Only females show an age-related increase in these areas at encoding. So, that effect was observed in the full sample as well. But when we looked at it in the full sample, we did not see that that increase in activation may actually be somewhat compensatory to females. It actually helped their performance during the easy task. Now at retrieval, older females do not engage these networks. And unfortunately, engaging these networks at retrieval supports cognitive performance. So that effect of the age performance trade-off that we saw in the second latent variable in our full group analysis was actually being driven by the females. And we wouldn't have known that until we disaggregated our data. Now, we identified several other PLS uh, results as well. And I'm not going to go into details about them. But what I want you to note is that when you look at performance, there's a lot of similarities. Sure, there's differences. But the males and females' performance effects overlap significantly, meaning that when you're doing the task well, males and females are engaging the same memory systems to perform that task. However, when you're doing it poorly as you age, the reasons for that performance decline is always different in the males and females. The age effect is consistently orthogonal in males and females. So the take home message from this reanalysis is that biological sex seems to matter when we're looking at neurocognitive aging. So even though there were no sex differences in the effect of age on memory performance, and when performance was good, when you're younger, males and females exhibited similar performance effects, the underlying neural mechanisms of age-related memory decline differed in males and females. Only females show this specific increase in frontal parietal activation at encoding in this sample. So yes, we, we show that disaggregating your data and reanalyzing old data to look for sex differences is fruitful. You will identify differences. But there's so much more that we do not know. And I really hope that if you're sitting on imaging data or behavioral data and you haven't considered looking at it by sex, that you do now. And maybe you'll find something and get another publication out of a, a grant that's expired. 
or something like that, right? And so then to address the next question about cognitive reserve and differences in um, basically between races and ethnicities. So in this sample, it was an extremely homogenous sample. I was guilty, right? So what was the inclusion criteria? And this is something that psychology needs to change. So psychology kind of evolved from, from testing young adults that were in our university environments. And then we want to test older adults. Oh, but we should match on education. That's an important variable. We've always known education was important. So who do we recruit? Older adults that are highly educated. Now, who are these older females that are highly educated? Like females that in the 70s and the 60s went to university or, or graduate school. That was very unlikely to happen back then. So what do we know about aging is very selective. So even in this sample, we tried. We developed a cognitive reserve measure based on IQ and education. And we looked to see, well, does this correlate with any of the performance-related factors that we saw in the lifespan study? Nope. It did correlate. So here, again, are these correlation profiles that hopefully now uh, you're used to seeing. Uh, Abdel El Sheikh, who conducted this study here, kind of plotted it a bit different. So sorry to confuse you. But um, here you see the reserve effect. That seems to be pretty constant across temporal, spatial easy, temporal easy, spatial easy, temporal hard. It didn't vary with age. It didn't vary with performance. So, but here was this reserve effect. So when you had higher education and higher IQ in this very restricted sampling uh, sampled group, you saw more activation. And when we look at this, it's actually a semantic network. So you have a lot of underlying superior frontal, uh, superior temporal activation, and then some left inferior frontal gyrus. But really, in this sample, with limited variance in education and IQ, we didn't see a reserve effect. Right, but. As I said, their education is really high, and they had high IQ. So I don't think that this indicates that perhaps lifestyle factors and education aren't important. I think what this highlights is that I was really guilty of conducting studies in, in weird populations, and this has to change. So how do we change this? So we have to recruit more broadly. This is so easy to say, and it's so hard to do. We're trying to do it in my lab. and it costs a lot of money and it takes a lot of patience and a lot of time. So we need to reduce barriers, develop meaningful relationships, and conduct more inclusive and representative research. One way to do this is really to build trust. This was something that was already discussed today. Um, we can't do this in a tokenistic way. We have to build relationships. We could learn a lot from the indigenous research that's ongoing in Canada in building these long-standing relationships with communities and then engaging mem members from those communities in the research and building that trust. So individuals will take the time to come in and, you know, and participate in our research. And the other thing is, once they participate, don't just drop them, right? It's like, it's like dating someone and ghosting them. Don't do that, right? So when, when they do participate, you have to maintain those relationships. Keep, you know, send them back some feedback on the study. Engage them in a, next, in a next study that you do and keep that relationship alive. It's not cheap to do, and this is something that the funding agencies in Canada need to consider and our institutions need to consider. That if we want research, especially health research, to move in this direction, maybe the institutions can take the lead and build these relationships. Therefore, researchers then have kind of a segue to meeting these communities and helping this type of more inclusive research occur. So we have to re remember the seven words that is used in indigenous research, respect, relevance, res reciprocity, responsibility, rights, relationship, and reconciliation. So this is not just for indigenous populations. It's also for immigrant populations and underrepresented populations in our societies that, are, that don't see themselves in the data. Okay, so we need to enter relationships, learn to understand the views of the groups that we're including in our research. And I really do emphasize including more diverse members in your research teams and who is doing the research. Language is a big thing, right? So if you don't have someone speaking the language of individuals that you want to include in research projects, you're already facing a barrier. So including diverse people from different linguistic backgrounds could really help us uh, overcome these kind of barriers. So the other thing, once you recruit them, you're not done. Right? You have to really rethink the design of your experiment. 
and what your, what your inclusion and exclusion criteria are. So historically, we've always required some level of university education. Why? Right? It's a very small portion of Canada has university education. Why don't we go with the Canadian published norms and like drop our inclusion criteria for education? Yes, maybe your task can't be so difficult and you might have to simplify your experimental design, but that's kind of the cost of trying to include more people in your research and doing this kind of work. The other thing to keep in mind is what type of neuropsych are you using in human subjects testing to screen individuals? Most of the neuropsych that we use is Western biased, right? So even IQ, that's a Western biased concept. And CVLT, MOCA, MMSC, these are extremely biased measures. So where do we go from here? Like this is something that the neuropsychological community is dealing with and they are developing kind of these more inclusive neuropsychological assessments, but we have to get out of our comfort zone of using the CVLT or the RAL, uh, the Ray auditory and start using new types of techniques for screening individuals. In my lab, the best screening tool is the mock scanner. We bring people in, we put them in the mock scanner, which feels like an MRI, but isn't an MRI, has the sounds, and then it's like, can you actually stay on task? Can you follow instructions and do the experiment without moving, without freaking out in this environment? That's the perfect screening tool. And that's what we've been using for our study, actually. If you could survive, you're in. Come into the MRI. So, and to keep in mind that people that can survive that, that itself is a screening tool. And I wonder in the cognitive neuroscience how representative we can get, right? In some ways, the, the technologies that we use to study humans screens many people out. People that are claustrophobic, people that just can't sit still for an hour or so, right? So we're always gonna have samples that are slightly weird, but hopefully we can make it a bit more representative. So the last thing we have to do, not what we can do, what we have to do is measure it. You could do everything, you could enroll, you could make your test as inclusive as possible, but if you don't look at your data, we're never gonna know if there's, you know, what are the similarities, how do individual differences map on to your results, et cetera. So you really do need to measure it. And this is kind of what my lab is doing now. So we're now conducting a large cohort study looking at the brain health and midlife and menopause, or the BAM study. We have three questions that we're trying to answer. Are there sex differences in the effect of age in the neural correlates of episodic memory at midlife? We know there is across the adult lifespan, but can we localize it to midlife? How does age and menopause affect episodic memory and brain function in middle-aged females? And does this affect interact with Alzheimer's disease risk factors. I'm not going to present to you any data from this study because COVID really did shut it down for a couple of years, so we're still going strong trying to get our samples up. But, you know, we're doing okay. So this is our recruitment to date. So the way that we made this study more inclusive is that we do online recruitment. So it's something you click and you answer a bunch of questions and then we decide, okay, you know, the, if you're healthy enough to participate, and that's the other term we use, healthy enough, instead of these strict screening criteria, we bring you into the lab. So what is healthy enough? So one thing you should know is that a lot of middle-aged females are on SSRIs. And so we had to basically drop that exclusion criteria that's historically been implemented in cognitive neuroscience. And what we do instead is we administer um, psychiatric evaluations and inventories to make sure, you know, see if their depression is controlled at the time of testing? Is their anxiety controlled at the time of testing? Because most people, especially post-COVID, might be on some sort of medication. If we start excluding most people, then again, we're getting into the weird territory. So we really have to, we have meetings every month where we look at everyone's chart based on enrollment. It's time consuming, but this is how we increase our sample size and our represent representation. So we keep going. So after, you know, after we do this enrollment, we also continue to engage in multicultural uh, communities by sending out newsletters in their language, engaging individuals, introducing patient partners, even though patients is really not the term, it's like participant partners in our research who receive these newsletters and then can give us feedback on what type of questions, what didn't we ask, what did we do wrong when we brought you into the lab? So this is something that was touched upon this morning and it really is important because you do learn a lot about, you know, well, I really didn't like the diffusion scan too much. It was really noisy 
and you know, made me nervous. So we moved that to the end of the scanning session so people can opt out of it, right? So you don't have to do that before you have to go through the, all the other scans, et cetera. And so we do online enrollment. We go to different communities. We advertise online as well, like Facebook, Instagram, anything. We're spending money <laughs> left, right, and center trying to get people into the lab. You have to for this kind of work. And then after the online enrollment, we invite them for one session where we take blood draws. We ask them questions to get at the social determinants of health. So they spend about an hour answering questionnaires. And then we send them home with more questionnaires. And we're like, if you can do it, do it. If you don't want to, don't. But we ask them about their reproductive histories. We ask them about you know, their childhood, about their parents' socioeconomic status. How well do they feel they're doing in society? So we have all these questionnaires that have been designed to ask these questions, and we include them, because we really want to deeply phenotype these individuals so we could do this type of individual differences analysis down the line. So we don't have to group them. And then if they survive all that and still want to come back for an MRI, we bring them in and we collect a variety of MRIs on them. So right now we're at 300 people in MRIs. That has to be updated. But we're hoping to get 800. And we're hoping to make this data set open so other people could use it and learn and maybe ask questions and tell us what we did wrong again so we could improve it in the next wave. And so the general conclusions I want to come to now is that I think our diverse communities in Canada deserve representation in our research. Right? If we want everyone to trust public health policies, we want people to buy in to the advice given them, to them by doctors, they need to see themselves in the data that's being presented. Why would I trust that data when I'm not in it? Right? And it also, there's an assumption that by ge generating these normal, generalizable models, that everyone fits into those generalizable models. That's not true. That's why individualized and individual differences is the way to go with this type of science. So we need to improve the representation of our samples by developing and maintaining these relationships so we could develop these more inclusive models. And importantly, we have to have clear, transparent criteria of how we're modeling our concepts of social determinants of health. So that's something, you know, instead of going to race or ethnicity and being lazy about what you're trying to measure, measure it and then develop using, you know, um, PCA or other sorts of analysis tools to come up with metrics that really can help us encapsulate what is environmental context. How do we fit in the psychosocial part, the psychosocial biological models of cognition and aging? So I really hope, you know, the goal of this talk was to motivate you to go look at your data if you have it and explore sex and diversity in the cognitive neurosciences. But I also hope that you'll take this home and think about your more mathematical models and think of how can you model social context into your math mathematical models and then consider individual differences in them as well? Thank you for your time. Yeah. So we, um, because we're looking at Alzheimer's-related risk factors, um, we ask individuals to donate their blood so we could genotype them and also use Samoa to look at A, beta, P, tau levels in their blood. And then we also look at all sorts of like vascular risk factors and protein biomarkers that put individuals at risk for vascular dementia. Yeah, so we, yeah, so I have a wet lab now, weird. Right, so, so yeah, where we, we take blood, we spin it, we send it out to Genome Quebec and to different labs to collect these measures. And then we also store blood in case there's new analysis or new proteins that come about that might be um, indicative of risk. So the goal of the BAM study is really early identification of women at risk of Alzheimer's disease. I think that's a very good question. I think it is a strategy approach, but I think your, the strategy that you employ as you age may differ 
bisects, right? So it could be, like one of the things, and I don't know how to test this, and maybe someone in the audience knows how to test this, is the idea that you know, women that are highly educated in this cohort and are older, right, employ this very cognitive control strategy to try and compensate for declines in their memory. But I wonder if it's only if you're highly educated that that happens in these older females, and that maybe males default to more linguistic kind of strategies as they age. So what you don't use daily kind of default to when things go wrong um, as you age. Yep. Yeah, and so we are, so we do collect, so in the BAM study, I didn't go into too much detail, but because it's about women's health, we collect hormones at the time of neuropsych, and then like some of the blood is used for hormonal analysis. So FSH, LH, progesterone, E2, and T is collected at time of neuropsych and at time of scanning. And because of postmenopause, like we use ELISA uh, to look at E2, and it's not, like most people are non-detect after postmenopause because your E2 levels go really low. Um, we're using more an FSH E2 kind of combination to look at that. But yeah, it's a good point. Like in the sample, we could totally do it. In lifespan, we couldn't. Yeah. Yeah. The sample size is like we're starting with 800, but we're collaborating with um, a scientist, Emily Jacobs, in California, who basically is trying to link up all the UC systems data, right? So we're hoping to build a large enough cohort to start testing different things out. And then there's also individuals in Toronto that are collecting data. So they're, we're trying to create hubs of individual scientists that are collecting. We're trying to um, harmonize the key MRI measures that are not like every lab's Every lab has their favorite task fMRI protocol, so we're not going to harmonize that. But we are going to harmonize like T1, T2, and resting state and diffusion across these sites, and then harmonize our reproductive health questionnaire and our diversity questionnaires. So we can scan in multiple sites, so that increases our diversity, and then have the sample size to answer these down below. So it's a, it's a collective effort. I'm one of the people of many women that are interested in this, and men, and men that are interested in this question. Yeah. So, so I use the term neurocognitive strategy because it's neurocognitive and not self-initiated. So I, when I use the term strategy, I do not mean to imply that they're consciously switching the strategy that they use. Individuals approach tasks in different ways, and it's often implicit. They don't, like we do ask at the end of our experiments, we do a debriefing questionnaire where we ask individuals, how did you do this experiment? There are people that cannot answer that question. They're obviously doing the experiment, they're like, I don't know, I just memorized. I just remembered, right? So they can't really tell you the strategy, whereas other people are very articulate and said, oh, well, I made up a story, you know, of the faces. And there you go. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so it's really important. I had a slide that I took out 
um, <laughs> for time, which we talk about sex and gender and gender. So there's three different things to keep in mind. There's sex assigned at birth, which is what we use. So what is your sex assigned at birth? What's on your birth certificate? Um, and then there's gender identity. What do you identify with? And then in the sex assigned at birth, you could answer female, male, intersex, other, right? And then when you ask about gender identity, we have like a broad range of options. And then we have a gendered lifestyle questionnaire. So not just the BEM questionnaire, which is about gender identity and gender roles, but a questionnaire that was de designed by one of our colleagues, Louise Pilot, uh, called the Genesis Praxis, which really looks at social determinants of health that are gendered in individuals' experience. So how much caretaking, you know, um, who's the breadwinner, those kind of questions to get gendered lifestyle. So you're right, there's many levels to look at. So you have the sex the assigned at birth, and then you have genetic sex, which is different. Then there's the, the sex of the cells that are expressed, which is different even more so. We're just looking at sex assigned at birth. We do include transgendered individuals in our studies. So there's a study that we're doing in collaboration with Jillian Einstein at University of Toronto. She's really interested in transgendered individuals and aging in transgendered women. And so we're recruiting individuals for her for that study as well. So basically, the approach we're taking with BAM is almost everyone is welcome to participate unless you have like a neurological disorder or, or, or a severe psychiatric illness, right? So we, we're trying to, but you have to build these cohorts. It's very hard to answer these questions in humans. It takes a long time to get the sample size needed. That's a really good question. We haven't done that to date, but that's an important to look at sex and its interaction with social determinants of health and things like that. Yeah, very much. It's an important thing to consider. Yeah. You should see the question. We have like, if you look at the database, there's like 2,000 variables. It's like, oh. Don't, but we don't have the sample size to look at all these questions. So we're just building right now. So right now we're using like principal components analysis to reduce some of our data and just get components to look at. And then for the imaging, we, we use multivariate PLS for the most part. But we also use univariate connectivity methods as well. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think the individual differences approach we could we kind of include as people go, and as as other variables are included, we could like re we could resubmit to the PC and create new vectors to include in our analysis. But you're right, like. Usually in most statistics, and when you do like for political reasons as well, we don't disaggregate below an N of 10 or anything, right? So we just, we just don't do that. Um, in our analysis, because it's behavioral PLS, we really try to not go below 80 people per, per analysis. Like that that's uh, sex and gender analysis that we did with Savanya was really because it was a reanalysis and to challenge that that was really publishable, I think, because the sample size was very small. But yeah, how tractable, it will be as tractable as the funding agencies want it to be, is my answer <laughs> to that question. It requires a lot of long-term planning and long-term alliance building. Yeah. Okay. In Oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Like you mean to the database? Yeah, so it's a separate consent. 
So in this study, they come in, they consent for the enrollment online, that this data is going to be downloaded to our lab. They consent to participate in the study, right? They, per they consent that their blood will be used for genetic analysis and they will not know the results, right? And they consent that their blood will be used for other things, right, related to the questions of this particular study. And then they consent that they will be okay for their data to be on a database. And then once we get the database set up and we want to go open, we have to recontact everybody and make sure they're okay again. So that's how it happens. So it's a long, it's not, when you see these, yeah, it's a long, arduous process. <laughs> No, I don't think so because we, so one of the things about um, sharing it is you randomize it, which means that you, you strip, like with the images, you strip the nose, you strip the skull, like you can't tell unless you have, an, you know, if you have a lesion, you're not in the study, I mean, right? Um, we don't put any identifying data in the database, such as postal code or anything like that, right? Um, and everything is randomized in the sense that even my lab, once it goes open, won't know who's who. Right, so you randomize your subjects so that the data stays the same, but their identifier to what you have in the lab is gone. And so that's the way that you could make it open. Otherwise, if there's any way that you could go from what's online to what's in the lab, that's unethical. You can't do that. Yeah. Yeah. That's very, that's, I think like Emily is doing that in the States, she's partnering. Uh, the issue here, Canada is a lot harder to do that in. And the other question is they don't, they don't have MRI data, right? Um, they have behavioral and they don't ask like the, they don't ask the social determinants of health questions and the reproductive health questions, right? They have a lot of like basic demographics and their blood work, but not much else. So, but there are like some questions, you could definitely look at that data and like sign up to use their data. You could sign up to use their database, right? And pay, pay for inclusion. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so yes, Sivanya did that study. And so we did it in collaboration with Deborah Titone, um, where we looked at bilingualism and its effects on providing cognitive reserve in the adult lifespan uh, in relation to the Wisconsin card sort task, which is a more executive function task. And what we found was it did benefit performance, but only for middle-aged females, which is what, that was the first study that made me think about middle-aged females. When we found that results, like, oh, that's interesting, what's going on here? Um, but there are some studies, but there's, that's hotly debated, right? Like, yeah, I, I use the term cognitive reserve because it encapsulates a concept that a lot of people kind of can identify with, but I actually prefer using the actual variables. So I look at education, I look at bilingualism, but when you start listing all the variables, people tune out, so I just use the term cognitive reserve because so people understand that term. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll clear one more talk.